All right, class. Today we're going to do. All right, class. Today we're going to do a video on plants. You see the picture on the top left it says I'm a plant cell. Draw a plant cell. You see the plant in an actual cell. Hopefully none of you guys are going over there. Then on the bottom left it says, put a little plant in your mother's bed. That's sweet of you, darling. Did you two finally sell your differences? Almost. Yeah, that's a Venus flytrap. They're heterotrophic and autotrophic. <laughs> All right, today we're going to look at plant reproduction, how they actually form offspring, the structure of the plants, and a few basic adaptations on how plants actually survive. If you look at the picture um, in the background here, this is actually from the Green Belt. Some of you guys might have actually walked the Green Belt in Austin. Um, I actually did the seven mile trek once. Um, luckily, it wasn't super hot then, but I saw a wide diversity of different species. Okay, here we're going to have one of our students uh, describe the parts of a plant cell. Uh, plants are unique, and in that way they have chloroplasts, cell walls, and chloroplasts are green because they contain chlorophyll, the energy capturing chemical. Okay, if you remember chloroplasts, they make the color green because they reflect a green color of light. If you see on the anatomy of a plant cell here, your chloroplasts are the green membrane-bound organelle. A few other important organelles are the nucleus. Your nucleus holds all your DNA. You also have the cell walls. Cell walls is the protective structure for plants because plants can't move, so they need that additional barrier there. Different from an animal cell that don't have a cell wall, um, they also don't have the chloroplast. All the other organelles are essentially the same. They have ribosomes. If you remember ribosomes, think ribs. If you eat a lot of ribs, you're going to get a lot of protein. They also have mitochondria, just like animal cells do. Your mitochondria think mighty. If you're mighty, you are strong. So mitochondria gives you your energy. So what's interesting about plants is they're autotrophic. They get energy from the sun with their chloroplasts. But they also get energy to break it down from the mitochondria. Here I have a cross section of a leaf. So let's say you took a leaf from a plant and you um, put it under a microscope. You'll see in your learning target you have a booklet models. Make sure that all the circled parts you fill in on your sheet. Main parts here is a cuticle. That's the outer layer. It's usually a waxy surface. That's why water can help stay into the leaf. In the water you have your xylem and phloem. For xylem, think water. For phloem, think sugar. Here I drew a little picture of a little hill here. We have a cherry or some sort of fruit that has sugars in it. It's going to flow down into the happy face because they're going to get all the energy. You also have veins that's part of your xylem and phloem. And we also have stomata and guard cells, which we'll look at later. Stamens produce pollen, male reproductive organs similar to sperm. Pistols are where ovules are produced. Eggs, po eggs. Pollen must land on the pistil for reproduction to take place. So here if you look at a general structure of a pollen, if your stamen, think men, men means male obviously, the stamen has your anther and your filament. From your anther and your filament, from the anther you actually have pollen that gets released. So just imagine a bee taking in the pollen from the anther and then it goes to another flower. It's going to have to go to the female part of the next flower. That's called your pistol. Imagine a girl with a pistol or a gun. It'll be a way to remember it. The pollen from the male reproductive cell has to go to the stigma first. Then it goes down the tube of the stigma through the style into your ovary. Okay? Ovary is the same word for plants and for animals. Here's your stamen, settle, and pistils. When it gets into the ovary, you have germination occur, and then eventually you have fertilization when the cell starts to produce more flowers. Okay, your stamen is the male part of the flower. It has an anther at the end to produce pollen. If you look at the picture over here. You have your anther and your filament, and the pollen is located right at the edge. So again, think of a bee rubbing along there. It's getting some of the food from it, but then it also helps pollinate. That's called a mutualistic uh, situation, right? The bee gets energy, the flower gets to reproduce, so they both benefit. 
Here's a picture of the stigma style and ovary. These are the female reproductive parts of the flower. So if you have a bee or a hummingbird, say, flying into one area, it's going to fly into the next pollen, and then it'll be able to reproduce from the pollen going up to the ovaries. Okay, next we're going to look at a few quick adaptations. That's how plants survive in difficult conditions. If you think about a desert, obviously the cacti, it's pretty tough for them to live because, one, they have a lot of sunlight, but they don't have enough water. Obviously, conserving water is very crucial in order to survive. Next slide, we're going to talk about how they actually hold in the water. If you type in TPWD on Google, you'll see a website that has a lot of information on different plant adaptations. Stomata. Stomata is the singular stoma. Occur in the underside of leaves. They are the adaptations for conserving moisture. Stoma control the rate of transportation of water when water is released to the atmosphere. So here you have the stomata. These are little circular like structures. If you look under the microscope, here you have the stomata. You can see that the size of the stomata right now is about 10 milliliters from right here to right there. This is where the opening of the stomata is. It actually gets bigger and smaller depending on how much water there is. So let's imagine you have a lot of water. Obviously the stomata are going to want to get wider so the water goes in. If there's less water, like a cactus in the desert, they usually keep their stomata really closed in so they hold in as much water as they can. When you're looking at flowering plants, you can also have plants that produce seeds. Some of the different types of seeds you have are the monocot. Mono means one. So these actually have one solid seed. Um, their stem vascular bundles are scattered, meaning you see the veins of it spread out throughout. This is a walnut, and if you look at the actual veins of the walnut or the um, xylem and phloem, you can see that they're scattered throughout. Right? It's a way to remember monocots. The roots are advantageous. That means that if there's a lot of water, they could pick up more. If there's not that much water, they just hold in their water better. The flowers are also in multiples of three. So if you see a three-petaled flower, you know it's a monocot. Next you have your dicots. Di means, remember, two. Think of a disaccharide, two sugars. These are seeds with two seed leaves or two cotyledon. The veins are webbed instead of scattered. Another way to remember it, your flower parts are in four or five. Okay, so when you're doing the fun game and you take the petals out of the flower, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. If you have a dicot, it'll be a different answer than a monocot because of the multiples. All right, class, so that's a quick overview video of plants. Feel free to check my website, um, type in Mr. Twinsky Hayes on Google, or just leave a comment down below if you have any questions.